Welcome to this lecture for Behavioral Statistics. We'll be talking today about probability. So an overview, talk a little about the mathematics of probability, talk about how it's relevant to inferential statistics, talk just a bit about random sampling, and then most of the time we'll talk about the normal distribution and how we can use that to look at probabilities and proportions uh, as they relate to z-scores and probabilities and proportions as they relate to scores. Okay, in terms of the mathematics of probability, probability for a specific outcome is defined as a fraction or proportion of all the possible outcomes. So if all the possible outcomes are identified as A, B, C, and D, then the probability of A, just some of those outcomes happening, would be equal to the number of outcomes classified as A divided by the total number of possible outcomes. So all the A's, B's, C's, and D's added up. Okay, so let's apply that to an example. So if the sorting hat randomly places students in one of four possible houses, Gryffindor, Slytherin, Hufflepuff, or Ravenclaw, right? So not based on where you actually belong, it's just total, total random chance. So the probability of any one student being sorted into Slytherin, how would you figure that out? Well, based on what we just talked about, we're talking about one of four possible outcomes, so that goes in the numerator. And then the, all possible outcomes, there's four possible outcomes, so it's one out of four, or 0.25, or 25%. What about the probability of uh, one student being sorted into either Slytherin or Gryffindor? Okay, when we talk about the probability of two things and we combine them with an or, this or this, then you typically just add the two probabilities. So that'd be uh, the two outcomes. So one uh, being Slytherin, one being Gryffindor, so one plus one is two. Still out of four possible uh, total outcomes gives you 0.5 or a 50% chance of being in one of those two. Okay. What about the probability of a student being sorted into a house other than Slytherin, right? So not that one. Okay, well that leaves you with, well it's not that one, well there's three others, so three goes in the greener now. So three out of four, 0.75 or 75% chance. Okay, basic mathematics of probability. Okay, why does that matter for inferential, inferential statistics? Really, probability is the what connects um, samples and in, in populations, right? Because we're interested interested in populations. We're interested in these large groups of people and large groups of events, but we can never measure all those things in one particular study. So we always have to come down and settle for getting a sample. And then we find something out about that sample. And what we find, oh, the average score was this. That's definitely the average score for this group, right? But is that average score representative of the sample that, it, that the, is it, sorry, is it representative of the population from which the sample was drawn? Well, that's where we get into um, probability. Right? And so the question often comes about uh, what is the probability that an observed sample came from a theoretical population? Right? So uh, assume that there's a population of people where some treatment had no effect on the dependent variable. Right? That's kind of our null hypothesis where nothing happens. So, okay, this treatment doesn't work. So if this treatment doesn't work, then the people that we get our sample and uh, we do stuff to them, if it doesn't work, then they came from the population where it doesn't work, because that's everybody, right? That's the reality. Um, but you're hoping that your scores don't look like it doesn't work, right? You're hoping that it looks different. So that's where you come into, well, when you get this sample and their scores look like it did work, okay, so uh, they did have this change in scores on depression or change in anxiety or change in happiness, whatever it is. Okay, what are the odds that this sample that you got that you that you that you observed um, that got the treatment is from the population where it didn't work, right? And basically, it's like, well, if it's a low probability that this sample came from a population where the treatment didn't work, well, then the treatment must have worked. Like they came from a population where the treatment does work, which is a weird roundabout logical circle. I know, but again, that's how it works. You have to assume the null, right, where the treatment doesn't work, and we say, okay. We got these people, here's this measure. Okay, if the treatment really didn't work, well, what are the odds we'd get a finding this big? Well, get a finding this big, it'd be really weird, it'd be really rare if the treatment didn't work, if the null was true, 
Therefore, we're going to reject the null. Right? So how rare does it have to be? And how do we define that? Well, that's where uh, the application of probability comes in. And we'll be talking about kind of the, the foundational building blocks of, of that, lo that logic in this lecture. Okay. But to make this work, we have to use, uh, at least for the, the theoretical models, random sampling, right? which typically we refer to as independent random sampling. Um, but again, it's usually shortened to just random sampling. Uh, but there are two different types, simple and independent. Typically, when people say random sampling, they mean independent random sampling. And independent random sampling has to have two things. One, each individual has an equal probability of being selected. So if you were to, um, you know, get out uh, this master phone book of everybody in the United States uh, um, and you, you randomly put, flip, flip the page, drop your finger down, call the number, and the numbers you call are people that are going to be in your sample. Would that be a random sample of the people in America? No. Right. And why not? Well, because not everybody in America has a phone, particularly a phone that would be listed in a phone book. Now, might that be a random sample of people who have a phone number in a phone book? Sure. If that's what you were looking for. So, because, again, when we talk about the population, it's a bit subjective. You just, you do get to decide what population you're trying to sample from. But for whatever, whatever population that is, every person has to have an equal opportunity, equal probability of being selected. Nobody has a, a better chance of being selected than somebody else, right? So you say, okay, the first 10 people that walk in the door, uh, they're going to be in the study. Well, no, because there may be something different about the people that got there early and people who got there late. That's not, they don't have an equal chance. People that got there late didn't have the same chance as somebody else who, who got there early. Okay. So the equal probability. And the other thing, the probabilities must stay constant for each individual. So after, um, uh, one person's been selected into the study, everybody else still has the same amount uh, of chance of being selected in. And what's th what this means is, theoretically, you must be using sampling with replacement. So if you do have, um, let's say you have the population, you have phone numbers for everybody, everybody in the population, you can draw out of a hat. It's got a huge theoretical hat. Uh, if you draw a phone number out, okay, here's one person who's in my study, and you had a million phone numbers in there, right? If you take that number out and you now set it aside, because they're in the study, okay? When you first drew it, everybody had a one in a million chance of being selected, right? If you draw that number out and you don't put it back, now the remaining people have a one in 999,999 chance of being selected, right? They have a better odds of being selected because it's a smaller pool. So you have to put that number back and draw again for it to be truly independent random sampling. So this is super important for theoretical foundations of statistics. But for real world importance, it depends on a couple of things. When might it be important to get a, a truly uh, random sample? If you're doing a study to say, okay, uh, we've got this new drug and we think it can make people uh, happier or we think it can uh, shrink tumors, we can, whatever we think it can do, is it, is it possible of doing this? And we're going to get a sample of people, we're going to um, then randomly assign people to two groups. One group gets the drug, the other group doesn't get the drug. Okay. Now, not random assignment, but going back to random sampling, getting people into the study. Does it matter, how much does it matter, if that was a random sample from the population? Maybe not that much, right? If you got, you know, all people in your study who all um, live in the same state, well, it's probably not a random sample of the United States, certainly not the world. But if you randomly assign them to two groups and one group gets better and the other doesn't, okay, well, the drugs seem to work for them. Does it work for everybody? I don't know. Let's do a study again. But we still have an important question answered in terms of can the drug work? When random sampling really matters methodologically is, is rare for our purposes. It's mostly for people that are... Um, trying to uh, predict things that are going to involve a population, right? Which the most common one being uh, predicting voting patterns, right? Where, <clears throat> you know, they'll survey 200 people to ask who they're going to vote for to try to predict, okay, whenever these 20,000 people vote, we're trying to predict it based on these 200. So when you were doing that 
type of uh, prediction, having an uh, independent, independent random sample, the more representative this, that sample is, the more random it is, the better it's going to model the future behavior. And in that case, it's important because you're trying to uh, show what all these people are doing. But for a lot of studies, we're not trying to kind of figure out what people are going to do on one particular thing. We're more interested in relationships between variables, uh, which again, these variables may have a, a relationship for these people in the study. And then the question of, well, is that relationship true outside of the study? Well, that's answered by the next study rather than trying to do it all in one study. So independent random sampling, uh, super important for kind of theoretical models of how inferential statistics work. But methodologically, if you're ever conducting research or if you're reading research, it's not that big a deal if they don't have a truly uh, random sample. And I'd say it's incredibly rare for a study to use um, independent random sampling unless they're looking at a pretty small population, right? If their population is, okay, all the students in a particular high school, okay, it might be feasible to get an independent random sample. But if your population is, let's say even the state of Texas, everybody living in the state of Texas, good luck giving everyone in the state of Texas an equal chance of being in your study, right? Because how are you going to reach all those people, some of which speak uh, different languages, right? Pretty tricky to do. So uh, matters theoretically, real world, not that important. But if we use random sampling in this theoretical sense, then we can talk about probabilities related to the normal distribution, which, and that'll make more sense when we get to the central limit theorem a little further down the road. But again, assuming uh, this is all gonna make sense someday, because of these uh, models uh, of probability are based on random sampling, we can look at the normal distribution. And the normal distribution is a curve, a curve with known properties, right? So if a distribution of scores is normally distributed, we can know what proportion of scores are above or below any given score in that distribution, right? And that's because somebody's done the math and figured out the shape of that curve. And once you know the shape of a curve, uh, at any point along that curve, you can uh, draw a line and calculate the area that falls under that curve, if you know the, the actual formula for the curve, which we know for the normal distribution, right? So, but because we can know the proportion of scores that are above or below, well, that means we can also know the probability of getting uh, higher or lower than a particular score, right? Because remember, probability is uh, number of outcomes classified as something divided by total number of possible outcomes. So if there's some distribution of scores, all the scores are in there. So the whole curve, everything under the curve is the total number of possible outcomes. And if you look at some part of the curve, some part of that graph, you imagine this graph in your mind, um, one part of it divided by the whole gives you the probability of getting that part. Okay. And as we'll see, you can also get probability between two points on that curve, not just above or below a single point. With some examples, this should make uh, some more sense. So uh, start off, assume that normal distribution, a normal distribution of scores has been uh, standardized with z-scores. Right? So kind of picture that z-score distribution in your head. So what proportion of scores are greater than z equals zero? Okay. So hopefully you remember that the z distribution is symmetrical, it's normal, and right in the middle, smack dab in the middle, is z equals zero. Everything to the right on the curve are positive z-scores, everything to the left are negative z-scores. Because it's symmetrical, half of the scores are above, half are below z equals zero. So in answer to the question, what proportion of scores are greater than z equals zero? 0.5, 50%, right? So if half the scores are above it, if you draw a score at random out of a distribution, uh, it's on, and it's been standardized, uh, and you calculate the z-score for that score, what's the probability of getting a z-score greater than zero? Well, the probability is 50% or 0.5, right? What's the probability of getting a z-score somewhere between negative infinity and positive infinity? Right? So now hopefully you're picturing the whole graph, not just half the graph. Okay, well, what's probably being somewhere anywhere in between negative and positive infinity, well, you're definitely going to have a score in there. So the probability is 1, 1.0, 100%, right? All the scores lie between negative infinity and positive infinity. 
half the scores lie above z equals zero, half the score lie, half the scores lie below z equals zero. So those numbers are easy. All the other numbers we have to rely on um, some uh, either uh, algorithms or if you look in the back of your book in Appendix B, there's the unit normal table that will tell you for uh, a given z-score what proportion of scores are below, above or below that score. Okay. So whenever we're talking about the normal distribution and we think about, okay, uh, some score or some z-score Imagine some line cutting that, that normal distribution into two pieces, right? And as long as you don't put it in the middle, if you put it in the middle, you've got two equal parts. Anywhere other than z equals zero, you're gonna have one part that's bigger and one part that's smaller. The bigger part, whichever part it is, the part to the right or the part to the left, is the body. And then the smaller part is the tail, right? So if you have just one score you're looking at and that score, um, let's say, is a, a positive z-score. So that z-score is going to be over to the right of the mean. Boom. Is the bigger portion going to be to the left or the, or the right? It's going to be to the left. So the body will be to the left for a positive z-score. Okay. So let's think about a negative z-score. So picture that in your mind. you got that graph. Negative z-score. Okay, well, that's to the left of, of the zero. Boom. All right, where's the body? Okay, well, now the bigger part is to the right, bodies to the right for a negative z-score. Right? Um, so if we're talking about just one score, you've got one tail and one body. Um, sometimes we'll talk about um, two scores, typically uh, plus or minus one particular score, like plus or minus you know, 1.96. And in that case, it's the extremities that are the tails and the thing in the middle is the body, no matter if it's uh, big or small, right? If you've got um, plus or minus 0.1z, okay, well, you've got these huge tails on a little body. So if you have one score, the little thing is the tail, big thing is the body. If you've got two scores, the middle is the body and the extremities uh, are the tails. Okay, so as I said, the unit normal table is in appendix B of your text. Uh, if you turn to that, um, I'd recommend it, kind of following along. The, it has a couple things, right? It's got a proportion of scores in the body or tail corresponding to a particular z-score, right? And as we said, proportion can be used to determine probability. But notice there are no, if you flip through that, that uh, table, it's a couple of pages, there's no negative z-scores in there, right? And there, don't, there doesn't need to be any negative z-scores. All you have to do is reverse which one is the body and which one's the tail for a positive and negative uh, z-score. And that's something that, again, when you're going through problems where you're having to figure out, okay, what's the probability of getting a z-score above or below this given point? Always draw it out. Make a little sketch, a little doodle on your paper, and that'll help you keep track of um, if you're looking for body or tail in a particular question. And again, some examples hopefully make it uh, clear. So if we're trying to figure out what proportion of scores um, are above z equals 1.0. So we flip through and we find z equals 1, and z equals 1 we see a couple of things, right? We see uh, proportion in the body is in column B, proportion in the tail is column C, and um, column D is proportion between the mean and z. So the question is, well where are we looking? We're we looking uh, in B, C, or D, and really we're looking between, is it B or C? Is it, is it tail or body? So we're looking at um, for positive z, looks something like this, right? Where a, the z-score, if it's positive, is going to be to the right of the mean. So if it's to the right of the mean, the body will be below and the tail will be above, right? So if we're looking at portion of scores uh, greater than z equals 1, we're looking for body or tail. We're looking for tail, right? Because it's up, above is over to the right. Above, up is right, down below is left. So we're going to look for that portion corresponding to the tail. Um, as we said, the body is below, tail is above. But for negative z, it's switched. I'm going to flip the image there. All right, for a negative z, well now the body is above and the tail is below. 
So for our example, uh, z greater than 1, um, all those z that are bigger than 1 are above, they're in the tail. So we look in column C, which is the tail, which is 0.1587. Right? So the proportion of scores above are 0.1587 scores are above z equals 1.0, or greater than z equals 1.0. That also means that 15.87% of the scores are above z equals 1.00. Right. And again, from when you go from portion to percentage, you just move that decimal place two spaces, right? Because you're just multiplying by 100 to make it a percentage. Uh, and then also means that the probability of getting a z-score greater than one is equal to 0.1587 or 15.87 percent. Right? So not super likely, not not crazy rare, not like oh one in a million, but you know uh, 15, 16 out of 100 times you're going to get a Z, somebody with a Z-score above one in a normal distribution. Okay. So what if we look uh, kind of the other way? So we looked at probability of getting uh, Z greater than one. What about probability of Z less than one? So it's a positive Z. Okay, so positive Z, it's over here. And less than that, okay, I'm looking down. Well. Below is going to be body if it's positive Z, right? So for Z less than one, it's in the body. So looking at column B, well, and we follow that little number, 0.8413, right? So note, one minus 0.1587 is equal to 0.843, and 0.1587 plus 0.8413 is equal to one, right? Which makes sense, right? Because the probability of getting above one was 0.1587. Probability below, 0 0.843, 8413. Probability of above or below, one, right? Because above or below is everything, right? Um, so now you're starting to think about this. Uh, got some questions for you. Which do you think would be uh, more probable? Getting a Z score greater than one? or a z-score less than one. And that should be pretty easy because we just looked at the numbers. We know the probability of a z-score less than one is 84.13%, right, or 0.8413. But also if you just draw the graph, you should see, okay, well, the if for z equals one, we're we looking below it or above it, which one's more probable? Well, the body is bigger than the tail, so the body's more probable. What about if we um, change it up a little bit? Probability of Z greater than negative uh, 1.0 or less than positive 1.0. Which one do you think is more probable? Hopefully you're realizing that's kind of a trick question, Dr. Kelly, because if you look at the graph, a picture in my head, they look pretty similar, right? And we can check that out. Probability of Z uh, greater than negative one, or we can body or tail. All right, so if the Z is negative, okay, we're looking greater than, so greater than is to the right. Well, the body is going to be on the right. So I look in that column uh, B, which is uh, 0.8413. And we remember earlier that the probability of Z less than uh, negative one was also 0.8413, because again, the distribution is symmetrical. That's something to, to keep in mind. It'll help you solve uh, some of the problems you have to face. Okay, what about um, the probability of Z greater than negative two? So we're looking at tail or body here. All right, so picture in your mind, okay, Z equals negative two. All right, that's over on the left of the mean. Greater than is to the right. Okay, so the big, big, huge chunk is going to be the right, so I'm going to be looking in the body, right? So column B, I look for two, because there is no negative two. I just have to keep in mind which one I'm looking at, and I see that for the body, it's 0 0.9772, 97.72%. Okay. What about, what's the probability of Z greater than two or Z less than negative two? So probably you're getting, getting a, either a really big score or a really small score, 
Right? And as we said before, when you're doing probabilities and you have an or in there, you just add the two probabilities. You add the, the, all the cases from each one of them. So the probability of z uh, greater than positive 2. Okay, so we're positive 2. We're over here on the right. Greater than, even to the right of that, that's going to be the little part of tail. All right, less than negative 2. Okay, well, that's going to be to the left of the negative 2, the negative 2 on that side. Also the tail. So the two tails are going to be 0.0228 and a 0.0228, 0.0456. Pretty rare, right? Less than 5% of the time. Less than 5% of the time, we get somebody who either has a huge, really big score uh, above 2 or a really small score be below negative 2. And when I say really big and really small, it's based on this rarity, right? For a Z of plus or minus 2, that kind of is pretty close to the boundary of what we call uh, pretty rare, right? Because we, in, in inferential statistics, for a variety of historical reasons, we consider things that happen only 5% of the time to be rare. Um, so what about, so we're talking about the first question was the probability that outside, you know, in extremes, you know, more than two or less than negative two, what about the probability of a score is between plus or minus um, two? So less than a positive two, greater than negative two, somewhere in the middle there. Well, we could go through and do a lot of uh, funky things, or we just go, well, we know the probability of the extremes of the tails is that 0.0456. And we know the probability of the whole thing is 1. So 1 minus those tails will give us the middle. So there's a 95.44% chance that we'll get a score between z equals negative 2 and z equals positive 2. So what about if we're looking at uh, two scores uh, that aren't the same, or two different scores? The probability of getting between uh, z equals negative 1 and z equals positive 2. So with all these problems, I always say graph it. So draw your thing, draw the lines where z equals negative 1 is roughly, you know, and really the main thing is to get it on the correct side of the mean. And for z2, where is it, right? Are they both, are they on the opposite sides of the mean? Are they on the same sides of the mean? Because that'll tell you different things, right? So this one, since one's positive, one's negative, they're clearly on different sides of the mean. And we're now we're looking for the middle section between those two lines. Right? There's two ways to look at this. One, we can figure out those extremes outside of negative one and outside of positive two, which would be the tails, and we do, okay, one minus those tails. Right? So one minus the probability of z less than negative one plus the probability of z greater than uh, positive two, which again, we go to the table, our z is negative 1, less than, we're looking at a tail. Okay, so that's um, going to be a c, and same thing for above a positive 2 is also going to be a tail. So we get uh, 0.1587 for one of them, 0.0228 for the other. Add those two things together, take it away from 1, so they add up to be 0 0.1815. 1, the whole thing, minus those extreme tails, leaves us that 81.85% in the middle. Okay, So that's one way to solve this type of problem. Another way would be to add the probability of going from 0, the mean, out to the left, and 0, the mean, out to the right. right? So basically you've got the probability of um, getting a score between 0 and negative 1, and adding that to the probability of getting a score between 0 and positive 2. And we do that because we have that that third column, that, that D column, which is the proportion between mean and Z. It tells us, okay, what proportion of scores are between Z equals zero, the mean, and any given Z score. Right? So again, for uh, uh, Z equals negative one, and something to keep in mind here, for Z equals negative one or Z equals positive one, that column D is going to be the same, right? There's the same proportion of scores between 0 and negative 1 as there are between 0 and positive 1 because it's symmetrical. So here you don't have to think about flipping things. Just, oh, yeah, 1. So for uh, 1, column D is 0.3413. And for 2, column D is 0.4772. Add those two together, and voila, we get the same answer, 0.8185. 81.85% of the scores are between negative 1 
and positive 2. Okay. Um, now I won't go through another example of this, but you kind of think you're getting the idea, hopefully. Just keep in mind, if the two scores are on the same side of the mean, so we've got you know, what proportion of scores are between uh, z equals positive 1 and z equals positive 2, okay, that's going to be a little different, right? Just draw it out, draw the graph, and you should be able to figure out what scores you have to add or subtract, what proportion you have to add or subtract to figure out the piece you're missing. Okay, that's the key is, is visualizing it. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about uh, z-scores, but we can also talk uh, about scores in a distribution if those scores are normally distributed because we know the formula for the relationship between scores and a z-score. So if we assume a normally distributed set of scores where mu, the population mean is 50, and sigma, the population standard deviation, is 2, what's the probability of a score being greater than 54? And again, you can't look up, there is no 54 in your appendix B. All your appendix B has are Z scores. But that's cool. That's super helpful because it doesn't matter what these scores are. It could be mean of 50 with a score of 54 could have been mean of 100 with a score of 104 a mean of 3 with a standard deviation of 0.2 whatever it is all different types of means and standard deviations and scores can be translated into z scores it's kind of this common language that's the great advantage so the first thing we're going to do here is translate these scores into our common language of z scores so we can talk about the probability uh, of getting scores greater or lower than a given score right. so uh, our formula z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. So again, the z we're looking at greater than 54 minus the mu of 50 divided by the sigma standard deviation of 2. So um, 54 minus 50 is 4 divided by 2. 4 divided by 2 is equal to 2. So we've got a z of positive 2. Now, quick, uh, quick check. What would have made it a negative z score? if the score we're looking at had been below the mean, right? If it had been 46 minus 50, okay, well, that'd be a negative number. That's going to give us a negative z-score. And again, that's all z, negative z means is, oh, it's below the mean. Positive z, above the mean. Okay, so we've calculated our, our z-score. And then we can just do what we've been doing. Probability of a z greater than 2. Okay, it's positive, greater than. We're we'll looking in the tail, column C, 0.0. 228. Uh, run through one more. Probability of a score being less than 49. So again, same thing. Calculate a z-score. Uh, z is equal to 49 minus 50 divided by 2. So now our z-score is a negative 0.50. So we're going to be looking at the probability of getting less than a negative 0.50. So okay, negative 0.50 is on the left, less than Okay, it's going to be a pretty big tail, but still the tail. So I can call them C, and it is 0 0.3085. Cool. Okay, get a little more complicated now. Still assuming the same normally distributed set of scores with a mu of 50 and sigma of 2. If you wanted to know, instead of saying... Um, given a score, tell me a probability, but well, we said what score separates the top 10.03% of the scores from the bottom 89.97% of the scores? Well, first thing you do, find the z-score that corresponds to the amount that, that fall in the tail, right? So if we go through uh, your appendix B and you're looking in column C, because we're looking at um, this kind of the top, separates the top from the bottom, so the top is going to be a positive z-score, so we're looking in the tail, column C, until we find mm -hmm. 0.1003, and we go through, do, 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 where is it, 0.103, and we take our finger over, what z-score does that correspond to? That corresponds to a z of 1.28. Okay, but again, we want to know what score separates the top 10.03%. Right now we have the z-score, so at z 1.208, everybody that gets a z bigger than that you know, is in the definitely in the top 10%, right? Uh, pretty close to it, within three hundredths of a percentile. So, 
So then you use the formula to find the corresponding score. So again, z is equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. So 1.28 is equal to x minus 50, some score, minus the mu of 50 divided by 2. So we need to now get x by itself, bring back some of those algebra skills. So I've got a fraction on one side and not on the other. So I want to get the x by itself is being divided by something. I want to get rid of that. So I multiply both sides of the equation by 2. Because again, whenever you have an equation where you have something equals something, if you do something to one side, as long as you do the same thing to the other side of the equation, you've not changed the truth of the equation. You can mul multiply both sides by 2, multiply them both by 1,000, divide both by 3, whatever you want. As long as you do the same thing equally, you're maintaining the truth of the equality. But again, multiplying both sides by 2 gets rid of that 2 on the right-hand side, right? So we've got 2 times 1.28 is equal to 2 times x minus 50 divided by 2. 2 times 1.28 gives me 2.56. And now the x minus 50 divided by 2 multiplied by 2, those 2s cancel out. I'm left with x minus 50. Now all i got to do to get x by itself is add 50. But i got to do it to both sides because I want to maintain the truth of the equality. And I come up with x equals 52.56. Right? Mm -hmm. So at uh, the score of 52.56 separates the top 10.03% uh, of scores from the bottom 89.97% of the scores. Okay, so I know that's a lot. You probably have to practice some of these things to really master it, um, but it's going to be important. I mean, it's important for a couple reasons. One, because given specific knowledge of the shape of a distribution of scores, which in this case we've been talking about the normal distribution where we know specifically uh, the kind of the formula for that curve so we know all these probabilities and we'll learn about other distributions of scores in the future t distributions f distributions where we also know uh, some different numbers but the same concept we know about the shape of those curves when we have that specific knowledge we can determine the proportion of scores above or below a given point and because of that we can determine the probability of obtaining scores above or below a given point or as we've seen between two given points or even outside of two given points so with this knowledge we can determine the boundaries or scores or z scores right that demarcate that set the edge of likely events right so we say okay scores out here way to the right way to the left okay at this point at z equals this or at this particular score at this point they become pretty unlikely at this point it's only 10 percent chance five percent chance one percent chance one in a thousand chance right we can tell exactly where those points are if we know the something about the mean of the distribution and we know something about the standard deviation of the distribution right so for example uh, probability of getting a z greater than two is much less likely than the probability probability of getting a z less than 0.50 and as we'll see having that knowledge uh, is the foundation of inferential statistics about setting those boundaries okay so once we once we decide okay we want to uh, be wrong a certain percentage of the time here's a hint it's often five percent if we only we can only tolerate being wrong five percent of the time we'll set the boundaries where super rare events are ones that occur only five percent of the time often 2.5% of the time above to the right and 2.5% below to the left to combine for overall 5% chance of being wrong. Right? And that's all based on these ideas of probability. Right? Cornerstone of inferential statistics, which again, we'll build on as we talk about in the future, central limit theorem. That's all for now. Take care.